Praise God. We're going to go in and sing, I will praise the Lord. Amen. Well, I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart, all of my strength. I will praise the Lord. I will praise. I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart, all of my strength. I will praise the Lord. Magnify, magnify and exalt the King of Kings. Jesus is Lord, so let all creation sing. Praise Him, adore Him, worship His name. I will praise the Lord, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart, all of my strength. I will, I will praise, I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart, all of my strength. I will praise the magnify, magnify and exalt the King of Kings. Jesus is Lord, so let all creation sing. Praise Him, adore Him, worship His name. Every knee. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Can't stop, can't stop praising His name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, Jesus, can't stop. Can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, Jesus. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm going to shout it on the streets. He is Lord, King of Kings, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. I'm gonna shout it on the street. He is Lord. Every knee, every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Every demon tremble every voice shall rise and say Jesus is Lord oh let's just give God praise amen thank you Lord God God we thank you Lord Jesus Praise God. Amen. We're going to have a tremendous time. Let's just give Pastor Warner a great hand as he comes today. Amen. Appreciate it, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. You have your Bible uh, turned to Psalms uh, 61. Uh, this is going to be a much different service uh, Pastor Rick got his 10,000 steps in <laughs> with thick carpet and thin road tires. I'm not moving much. So maybe it'll make it easier on everyone. So Psalm 61, uh, I, for the last 50 years or so of coming to conference, I have become a keen observer and eyewitness to the various conditions that pastors, their wives, and various people come to conference with. Uh, some of this is because central to the pastoral task is they watch 
for your souls. That means pastors pay attention. And it's part of trying to grow in uh, the calling that God has uh, given us and how to deal with things that are very unique to the pastoral vocation. And on top of all of this, I've observed it because I have been a very, very diligent student of human nature. And in particular, one person, and that is me, and my own life and observing all that God has done and the theme this week of fanning the flame. What a great message last night that he makes his ministers as flames of fire. But let me tell you a secret, and uh, uh, maybe uh, some can tune this out because you don't want to hear it. Not every pastor comes to conference feeling like a flame of fire. Many come feeling like a smoldering wick or a flickering candle. Now, last night's service uh, did a whole lot to uh, uh, alleviate uh, some of that. Uh, but many times uh, pastors come to conference uh, feeling like they have to become an alchemist. How do I transform the last six months of lead into pure gold? And you and I can look around this morning in our world and we can see very turbulent times. We can see very definitely times of acceleration. We can look up and thank God that he is our eternal and unchanging reference point whose promises are yea and amen, whose promises never fail. But we can also look within, and often one of the dominant emotions is the feeling of being overwhelmed. I want to entitle this message, Words for Overwhelmed pastors. And I know that I am narrowing my focus a bit this morning. But trust me, as you press on in your journey, in your commitment to fulfill the ministry God has given you, as you seek to strive to accomplish his purposes in every season of life. Hear me, you will not be a stranger to this feeling. And I want to read Psalms 61 with you this morning. I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation where it says, Oh God, listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. From the ends of the earth I cry to you for help. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the towering rock of safety. For you are my safe refuge, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. Let me live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O oh God. You have given me an inheritance reserved for those who fear your name. Add many years to the life of the king. May his years span the generations. 
May he reign under God's protection forever. May your unfailing love and faithfulness watch over him. Then I will sing praises to your name forever as I fulfill my vows each day. Let me start and talk about the frequent residence because one of the questions that is being asked in our world today is what is wrong with people? In other words, they are observing societies and nations, human behavior. What is wrong with people? The Atlantic magazine a year or so ago had an article written by Olga Kazan and her question was why are people acting so weird and in this she queried more than a dozen experts uh, on crime on psychology social norms. Uh, she worked through several possibilities and possible explanations for the growth of what she called disorderly, rude, and unhinged uh, behavior, meaning that people, just like Jesus said in the last days, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Uh, and at the top of the list, and uh, these people we know are very good at diagnosing problems, they just don't have any answers. At the top of the list, she said, we're all stressed out. And she quoted a business professor from Georgetown University on the data of why people are behaving so badly and found that, quote, the number one reason by far was feeling stressed out or overwhelmed. And even though you're called of God, even though, as Pastor Elliot preached, we are part uh, of a work of God, that doesn't exempt uh, any of us uh, from coming to this uh, specific address. I like what King Jehoshaphat uh, prayed in 2 Chronicles 20. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. That's a pretty good description of how we live uh, most of our lives. We don't know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. And this word in our text casts a shadow over everything, and that word is overwhelmed. Verse 2, from the ends of the earth I cry to you for help. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the towering rock of safety. Now that is a powerful verse for an international Bible conference. From the ends of the earth, there are in this building nations represented by pastors and laborers and uh, churches. I would uh, like specifically uh, to those, Sergei Golubev and our brethren pastoring in Russia from the ends of the earth. And the common pressing emotion behind this is when my heart is overwhelmed and the called for action is I cry 
to you for help. Now, you know, I know that your prayer life is so exquisite. It is unbelievably eloquent. Sometimes you are impressed when you pray at how spiritual you sound. But how many know sometimes prayer is just simply, God help! And he's describing something very real. One of the contributors uh, to this and uh, feeling the inspiration to preach it in our Bible conference here was last month in the build-up to our own uh, conference. I've been trying to uh, give myself to the task of writing a book which is a lot harder and slower than I first imagined. And I had to switch off that mode and switch on conference mode. God, I need to hear from you. What is it that you would have me to preach and all of the various elements, uh, the build up to conference and uh, all of the financial obligations. You know, it is nice to worship in a new conference center that was built, but, uh, and we enjoy that, we thank God for that, but there is a difference between paying $7,500 a month for a mortgage and then paying 40,000 a month uh, for a mortgage. Uh, uh, you know, everybody uh, thinks, oh, well, that's just, you know, a big church. The only difference is you have more and you have bigger problems. Same thing, nothing changes. It's just uh, a question of numbers. And so all of the financial obligations, airfares, bringing pastors in from all over the world, and right in the midst of all of this, I was hacked. My computer, a combination of a very slick move coupled with personal stupidity, uh, resulted in being hacked. And when that happens, you have to immediately start changing all of your passwords. So that happened right at this time. And, you know, uh, I, I, if I told you that I got up every morning singing the hallelujah chorus, I would be lying. Uh, you know, there was something that began to build up this deep uh, inner sense of uh, feeling overwhelmed. Uh, and it was right at this exact time, I get lots of emails or bloggers and other things that come to my inbox was an article that said five words for an overwhelmed leader. I didn't read the article. All I read was the title, and the title alone was the Holy Spirit's way of reminding me, son, I know what's going on. I've got you covered. And not surprisingly, this is why the Bible is anything but silent here. In fact, it describes this destination for people's heart and soul and spirit. Psalms 102 has as a title a prayer for one overwhelmed with trouble. Psalms 143, 4, therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is uh, desolate. In other words, you're not going to grow 
in your own ministry or in this work of God, no matter what stage of development you find yourself at, that will not occur without having times where you don't have the answer that all that you search for, you come up uh, empty, expectations uh, seem to be growing while your own sufficiency is decreasing. Uh, and it's kind of like uh, walking on a treadmill. Uh, you're moving, yes, but you're not going anywhere. I don't know if this is just my own type A personality, but days when I don't accomplish anything are vexing to me. And I'm glad that this is a work of God, not a work of man, but still when that uh, uh, is a description of not just one, but uh, you can string together many days. You're overwhelmed uh, that uh, you don't know what to step and what to, to give yourself to first. And, you know, you are doing a good job this morning of being in a Bible conference, uh, appearing to have it all together, not a problem in the world, uh, but for the two or three or maybe half dozen of you uh, that you relate to this feeling, uh, let me continue to understand and really grasp these overwhelmed uh, verses you find in the Bible that they are so frequently connected to waves and floods and waters that this idea of being overwhelmed is linked to the experience of drowning. So, 2 Samuel 22, 5, the waves of death swirled about me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. Psalms 88, you have overwhelmed me with all your waves. Psalms 124, then when the waters uh, had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. So they all bring together this idea this feeling of uh, drowning. We have in our church a brother who really came very close to drowning in uh, one of the beaches in Southern California, uh, decided it would be a good idea to uh, swim in the ocean wearing his Levi's and uh, got caught in a riptide and the harder he tried to swim, the further out he began to drift uh, as his energy began to be depleted. And I asked him about this and he said, I felt completely helpless. And then added to that, he said, I, I was overwhelmed by anger, meaning, wait, this is too soon to check out and overwhelmed with feelings of sorrow. And just before he uh, took uh, and inhaled a large gulp uh, of the Pacific Ocean uh, into his lungs and went unconscious, he said, I remember screaming out loud, God, you have to do something. And he woke up, came to his senses face down on the shore. And David said, look at it again there in verse 2. He doesn't say, if my heart is overwhelmed within me. He says, when my heart is overwhelmed. Mark it down. It is an address 
that it may not be a permanent one, it may be an Airbnb. <laughs> but it is a destination that all of us will frequent from time to time. And just try to remember this, saints. Jesus knows because he's been there. When he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, uh, then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus said, My soul is overwhelmed. So let's look secondly at some of the avenues of approach here. And it is hard to ask this in a Bible conference where, you know, we are all very studied at making sure we put on the correct pastoral face for everyone. And, uh, but to really grasp this is going to take a little bit of transparency. And the amens just roared. <laughs> because that is all of our strong suits. Paul and I have always been drawn to and love this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul is being transparent. He says, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed about what we went through and what we encountered in the province of Asia. Now, let me clarify for because it's necessary. Transparency doesn't mean that you go around bleeding over everyone that you encounter. You know, some people, you don't want to ask them, how are you doing? <laughs> because you know behind that question is, do you have a couple of hours? But Paul said, I don't want you to be uninformed of what we encountered. He's describing uh, this season, which was obviously an overwhelming one, but he did so to honestly relate uh, with the aim of soliciting their informed prayer. Not just a general, God bless so and so. I want you to, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. Why? So that you can pray with clarity. Because the winning tandem is always God's help coupled with the prayers of the saints. Made me think about the emotional life of the normal pastor and pastor's wife, where you can go from incredible heights of joy and rejoicing to the darkest depths of despair and that's just a 24-hour cycle. 
And so some of the roads are mapped out for us, especially in the book of Psalms. So let me just briefly touch on a few. The most recognizable is overwhelmed by multiple troubles. Jeremiah 45, 3, I am overwhelmed with trouble. Haven't I had enough pain already? And now the Lord has added more. I am worn out from sighing and can find no rest. You know, most of us here today are pretty capable of dealing with trouble. If it comes one at a time. We'll deal with this, we'll face it, we'll go through it, we're going to trust God. But I'm talking about when troubles multiply. And it's not just one, and it's not just two or three, it's more. And this is what Jeremiah is echoing. I am overwhelmed with trouble. He said, listen, haven't I had enough pain already? I've dealt with this, now I'm going to deal with this on top of it. And it doesn't take much to realize that your resources become depleted very quickly. And it produces a lot of questions like, am I really strong enough? Can I handle what I'm facing? Do I have what it takes to run and to finish the course and the tasks that God has assigned me? Am I able to stand up to the inevitable pressures that accompany those things? Overwhelmed by multiple troubles, overwhelmed by guilt. Psalm 65, verse 3 Though we're overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. Now, this is more than just a reference to David's glaring fall. I believe uh, in most of us, if we're honest, where he said we are overwhelmed by our sins, uh, how this manifests is we begin to question, am I really good enough? And to answer that, no, you're not. That's why you needed a Savior. How can I preach this message to others when I am all too aware of my own flaws, can have an overwhelming influence upon your life. Overwhelmed by being target practice. 1 Samuel 18, 10, a tormenting spirit overwhelmed Saul. And we know how that that torment was assuaged by David's musical gift and his worshipful spirit. But if you read on as this is taking place, Saul has a javelin next to him and in his mind is the thought, I'll pin David to the wall. Lord, I'm a little tired of being, you know, target practice for other people's frustrations. It is the price of leadership. You become a target for people's frustrations, uh, their criticisms, uh, their gaslighting, uh, and uh, you learn the art of dodging javelins to successfully fulfill your ministry. There is uh, also being overwhelmed by your thoughts about 
God. Job 19, 27, I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Now, one of the things that triggered this, I was reading, I believe the individual is a pastor, but he was telling how in his life and in his ministry, he was feeling overwhelmed. And one night he told his wife what he was feeling, etc. Thank God for pastor's wives who can speak God's mind and God's wisdom to her husband instead of affirming him in his madness. And so he says, you know, honey, I'm, I'm really feeling overwhelmed. And she asked him this question, which is brilliant. She said, what are you believing about God right now? No, no, I'm not talking about what you have in your doctrinal statement. I'm not talking about uh, what you will say when uh, you're before a gathering of people. She asked him, what are you believing about God right now? What are the kind of thoughts that are proliferating in your mind right now because as a man thinks in his heart so is he and this is a brilliant question because it really exposes and reveals do you have hard thoughts about god or do you Believe your heavenly Father is filled with love for you and your best interest. Do you believe that he delights and rejoices over you with singing? Do you believe that he is good no matter what's going on around you or even within you and that he is working all things together for good? to them that love him and are the called according to his purpose. What are you thinking about God right now? Do you believe that his steadfast love to you never ceases? Because the wicked servant in the parable of the talents uh, excused and justified himself by saying what? I knew that you were a hard man. Based on what? He's already given to you and your homeboys uh, all of these talents that aren't yours. Uh, he's blessed your life. What are you basing that on? I knew that you were a hard man. See, deep down inside, do you really believe that even though life is tough, God is always, always good? What are you thinking about him right now? Because, listen, if your thoughts about God are askew, you will be overwhelmed over and over again instead of being able to say like Paul, if God be for us, who can be against us? So let me close and talk about a wonderful transition. Because God, in a moment of time, can turn the page. That is the beautiful thing about conference, that no matter what condition you arrived in, and I know you, pick, you put aside your 
the best looking suit, you know, and you've got it all mapped out. Monday night, I'll start with this, and then I'm gonna save this for Thursday night, international night. And uh, of course, on Friday night, I really wanna come representing, and or you've got your dresses uh, all picked out. Uh, but uh, the reality of conference is regardless of your condition, God can turn the page. And it is as simple as that. You know, it, it, it doesn't take a, you know, a, a, a huge, uh, uh, major endeavor. He can just turn the page. And that's why, back to our text, when my heart is overwhelmed within me, put a space there, because what you write and what comes next is the determiner of the direction and the outcome and the growth of your life. When my heart is overwhelmed, within me. Psalms 142.3, when, when I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. When I am overwhelmed, what is my confidence? You know the way I should turn. It's like flying a plane. You're in the cockpit and you are overwhelmed. I, I don't want to be on a plane with you if that's the case. And uh, I know we're in a transition period and a lot of people are retiring and newbies are taking over. I'm not thrilled about seeing, you know, somebody who looks 28 uh, in the cockpit of, uh, you know, a, a 777 uh, international flight. Uh, but when I am overwhelmed, you know the way I should turn. And whether it's doctors or air traffic control, I don't know if they take a class in how to talk. Air traffic control is always calm, and you're overwhelmed. This is Prescott Tower. <laughs> to flight 371, that voice, because he knows the way I should turn. I want you to descend to 6,000 feet, heading course 223, and if you listen to that voice, even when you're overwhelmed, he knows the way I should turn. There's a great verse in Psalm 77, and you, you're a preacher, you could build a whole sermon around this, but uh, it is another psalm where he's overwhelmed with longing for God's help. And uh, it says that he brings a pathway no one knows was there. When I'm overwhelmed, he knows a pathway that no one else knows about, and if I will listen to him, he will talk me through. And this is why our text contains such a treasure chest of provision. Because when my heart is overwhelmed within me, lead me to the towering rock of safety. Now, I know that New King James, King James says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I like this NLT better. 
the towering rock of safety because a rock that is higher than I, I actually did this, I got a measuring tape from the top of my head to the floor, it's four feet, five inches. So a rock that's higher than I wouldn't be that big of a deal. <laughs> but a towering rock of safety is another matter altogether. He's talking about a place of safety, obviously, but more the need when uh, your heart is overwhelmed uh, is the need for perspective. Lead me to that towering rock of safety which brings a, a completely different perspective to my life and my situation. And in the psalm, there's no indication uh, that his immediate circumstances were changed, but there was a definite change in his attitude and in his perspective that lead me to the towering rock of safety. The military term and image here is overwatch. That before you go on a specific mission, before you're going to encounter the enemy in a, uh, uh, a potentially fatal situation, uh, you have someone on overwatch. Usually you want your best sniper there. And with his scope, uh, he can see what is going on, uh, which enables you to go about your mission with security and with confidence. Why? Because there's someone in overwatch. And the beautiful thing about this psalm, and one of the things we can all take away from it, is that God's provision can never be separated from his person. See, the greatest thing that God gives us, no matter what's going on in our lives, our churches, our ministry, is he gives us himself. The answer to everything is give me Jesus. If he makes his ministers a, a flame of fire, God, I am a smoldering wick. There's just a little bit of smoke and maybe, you know, it could be easily extinguished, but a bruised reed you will not break and smoking flax you will not quench. God gives us himself. And that's why this psalm is almost a visual overload as he sets before us picture after picture, image after image, a towering rock of safety. Then he goes on, you are my safe refuge. You are a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. You're a fortress, God, where these make me untouchable. Then he talks about your sanctuary, which is not a church service as much as it is a familial image about home life, uh, that I have become a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. And then he talks about under the shelter of your wings uh, that just like a hand shelters her chicks uh, until they mature, this is a maturing place uh, for all of our lives uh, and you will not come to any place of real maturity without finding yourself in times, in seasons where you are overwhelmed and you are forced to look to Jesus. Annie Johnson Flint, the story behind her song, He Giveth More Grace, is 
quite amazing. She is responsible for numerous poems and songs that are geared to dealing with faith and triumph in times of trial and suffering. And I was reading about her background, that she lost both of her parents before she was six years old. She was adopted by a childless couple and at 13 years of age was afflicted with arthritis and soon afterwards was unable to walk. Her desire was to be a composer and a concert pianist, but with that kind of illness, that would never be possible. And so, deprived of that vision, she resorted to writing poetry. Another truth in life is we love open doors, don't we? Oh, God opened a door. Hallelujah. Well, he also closes some doors, too. And she wasn't going to play the piano, but she could write poetry, and some of her poetry was later set to music. I think it was Danny Bell Hall who was a backup singer for Andre Crouch, who took that old hymn he giveth more grace, and he wrote, she wrote these words. He giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength as the labors increase. To added afflictions, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. He giveth more grace. And they told about a missionary couple from India who lived in Massachusetts when this song was newly released, it was in the 1940s, and some caring individual sent this missionary uh, a copy of it, and this is back when you had phonographs, record players, some of you, I won't get diverted to explain what those were, but she got her old, Victorola record player and begin to play this song and the needle got stuck on the words he giveth and giveth and giveth again and it got stuck and it said he giveth and giveth and giveth and giveth and giveth, and giveth, and giveth, and giveth, until joy started to rise within their spirit and understood that God is always faithful. And when my heart is overwhelmed within me, saints, there is a towering rock of safety 
where he can lead and guide and direct you and preserve your life and preserve your ministry and the purposes that he has for your life. I want you to bow your heads this morning and we're going to go to God in prayer. God can turn the page and you can go from being overwhelmed to being overjoyed. He begins the psalm when my heart is overwhelmed. He ends by saying that I will sing praises to your name forever. And I told you in the beginning that I was narrowing my audience in the sense that not every individual here or on live stream is in this current moment dealing with what is a very real emotion in the ministry of the gospel. If we're going to be flames of fire, we're going to have to learn how do I work through, how do I deal with these inevitable times that will come my way. I want to tell you that Jesus can turn the page today. And I don't expect everyone in this auditorium to answer the altar call in the sense that, God, this is where I am right now, stuck on a ledge, uh, feeling overwhelmed and panicked and not knowing what to do. But listen, just file it away. Save it on your computer because one day you will find yourself in that place. And the confidence that Jesus is enough. I feel the Holy Ghost because God does want us to go home as flames of fire, but some, we're going to have to work through some things in our own life, our perspective. Jesus is enough. There are some of you here this morning, and it may not happen frequently, but you have been subject to panic attacks, and, and you're having difficulty connecting the dots because they're not always directly related to specific incidents or individuals, you're not really sure, but you've dealt with this on more than one occasion. And simply be honest, admit it. There is no shame feeling overwhelmed with things in your life and your situation as long as you learn what to do, how to respond when this happens. Sometimes just getting out and going for a walk You better have somebody in your life that you respect, some kind of mentor who has been where you currently are, who you're not going to be threatened or reprimanded when you say, you know what? I don't know what is going on, but this overwhelming feeling is very much a stumbling block. And if you're going to get bigger, the saying is, you're going to have to get better first. 
This is why people for millennia have run and found refuge in the book of Psalms for what they're dealing with. And I want to open these altars right now. Some, it's like, Pastor, who told you about me? Others, there are different circumstances, but there are many people right now that God who giveth and giveth and giveth again to our multiplied troubles. He adds his multiplied grace. I want to open these altars for you to come. This morning we heard about the power and the impact of a work of God. Pastor Martinez on the need for the eyes of our heart, the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened. Now is the time to come before God and seal these things in his presence as we worship God and sing this chorus together this morning. Amazing grace. Yes, amen. How sweet the sound that, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. Amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but just to bow our heads you're at the altar praying and this morning I wanted specifically to pray for those as I said that and you're not really sure why what's going on but uh, panic attacks uh, you know you feel like you're having a heart attack. Anxiety just skyrockets. You even go to the hospital, is something wrong with me? No, there isn't. And listen, I don't know all the reasons why, but I do know when my heart is overwhelmed within me, lead me to the towering rock of safety. And if you're here, you say, Pastor, I've been dealing with this. It's been very troubling. I don't know why. I want you just to lift your hand. No one is just looking around, but you know this. This is a very common. I want you to pray with me right now. Jesus, I thank you that you are my savior 
and my deliverer. You have not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want my thoughts towards you to be sound and to be correct. I take dominion over anxiety, this overwhelming emotion that is tormenting. I am a child of God, and Lord, you are my refuge, and you are my fortress, where the enemy cannot reach me. And I claim that dominion for my life, for my family, for my ministry, and I thank you and give praise in Jesus' name. Let's just thank the Lord together. Lord, we honor and we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, Lord, we give glory to your name above every name. Lord, have right of way, help your people. Help your ministers, O oh God, to be those flames of fire in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want us to sing that chorus. What a fitting chorus again, that first verse of amazing grace as our brother comes to take the service and uh, looking forward with anticipation to tonight's service, a wonderful time in the Lord. Uh, God is going to flip the, and turn the page for many, many lives uh, this week. Let's sing it as our brother comes. Hallelujah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Praise God. Praise God. We have a great, great time this evening. Don't forget, prayer is at 5 o'clock. Service starts at 6 o'clock. Amen. Let's just be very prompt. Amen. At that, we're dismissed today. Amen.